in cities, you see some areas that become so unaffordable to the ordinary person mm. that it, be, it become a, a whole district of only wealthy people mm. or people from outside or from overseas who can afford to live there. And then the people who, who are the original owners or people who live in the city find that they have to go further and further away. Mm. And in Singapore, you're starting to see that. And this episode of the Yellow Bird Podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Ministry of National Development. We spoke to Minister Desmond Lee, who answered some very important questions on housing that are on everyone's minds. You can find links to everything we discussed in the show notes and we hope you enjoy it. And now, on to the podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Yala, ba, 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 ba. your thrice weekly podcast where we talk about the hottest news with a touch of what, Terence? Good old humor. Good old humor, yeah. man. And today we're going to be talking about something that's been in the news, uh, not just with a lot of with a good with good old humor, but with someone who is the best person to speak to about this. Definitely like, knows his stuff. Yeah, his definitely. Because uh, we have covered the topic of housing and HDB mm. uh, multiple times. But today, in front of us, we have none other than Minister for National Development, Desmond Lee himself. Mm. Uh, welcome, Minister Desmond, okay. to our podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, because yeah. we know your your days are stocked end to end with meetings. Mm. Uh, so thanks for taking the time. Oh, yeah. um, and and I mean you know it's a it's a the topic of housing is 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 been discussed like for I mean it's always at the at the top of everyone's mind. Yes. Like, mm. Right. Mm. Uh, and and uh, recently we just came off the committee of supply debates. Yeah. Uh, and and so so maybe just to 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 start off like um you know the the sentiment of housing right now uh mm. it is <laughs> it is a something that's been discussed a lot uh what well what would you say is the current climate around housing at this point well I think uh, we've got off some of the worst of COVID mm-hmm. because you know mm. before COVID mm. if you can cast your mind back you know a couple of years six seven years the market was relatively soft. Mm. Resale prices were, were down. People were actually complaining about why resale prices were going down. These were the homeowners. Mm. And B2 applications were, you know, were, were low. I wouldn't say very low, but they were stable. Mm. And if you recall, 2009 to 2011 was another hot period because of the uh, financial crisis. So it was stable for quite a number of years. And then COVID hit and uh, we were in a crisis and of course housing also badly affected yeah. uh, we had uh, housing delays you know we had uh, material delays disruptions workers were short uh, when we had to get, get back to uh, work after circuit breaker uh, we had to work at a much slower pace because of all the restrictions that covid uh, imposed on us and so as a result uh, you know good old economics how uh, housing supply demand totally off kelter mm. imbalance and then it resulted in what you could recollect over the last two years. Mm. Uh, B2 application shot to a peak, shot to the roof. Uh, resale prices were uh, aggressively on the upside. Uh, you see uh, rental going up. Yeah. Uh, you see uh, 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 people you know, rushing to buy homes. And so there were concerns about whether they could afford housing and whether they could get housing. So affordability and accessibility. But today I'd say that uh, we're not entirely out of the woods, mm-hmm. but... Uh, a lot of the uh, concerns have uh, been gradually addressed. So, for example, uh, the property market is starting to stabilize. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, resale price growth last year was half of the year before, and we're starting to see stability. And given the kind of uh, climate that we're seeing, economic climate, geopolitical climate, high interest rates, people getting a bit more uh, careful with big ticket items, uh, prices won't go up indefinitely. We'll, we'll start to see stability and we are seeing that already. Mm. Uh, rental price, rental uh, market for housing has begun to stabilize. Mm. People are now saying in the news that uh, from a landlord's market, now it's a tenant's market. Mm. And uh, uh, the prices are starting to stabilize. A lot of it's got to do with more supply coming on board. And thirdly, of course, the BTO applications, as I said, during COVID, it rose quickly because people were concerned about housing delays, better yeah. apply earlier. Uh, and now it's come back to uh, pre-COVID levels. Mm. So from a high of 5.8 a couple of years ago now to 2.9. And these numbers are how many applicants on average per unit that is available. Mm. So between first and second timers, the uh, B2 application rates have come down. So we're starting to see stability. Uh, we'll have to watch the next few quarters. Mm. Mm. Um, the, the concerns, I think, are largely, as I said, around uh, whether I can apply and get a home or mm. buy a resale flat. And secondly, whether I can afford a BTO or resale flat. 
of what they meant to private property. Some people buy private. Mm. So all in, I think, uh, still concerns. But uh, when it comes to something like the property market, you know, you have to uh, put in the measures, firm ones. You have to increase supply. You have to manage demand. Uh, and we have a whole range of measures. We can talk about some of them later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think more or less starting to, uh, uh, to, to, to cool down. But we have to watch to make sure that, you know, you reach a soft landing. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, there are millions of homeowners who are yeah. equally concerned if uh, prices uh, go down too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, just because you talked about going back to casting our minds back to COVID period, right? Mm. Actually, it was right in the midst of COVID where you also took over this the whole portfolio yes. of MND. Uh. Mm. Like, how did how, like, how do you feel during that period? Of course, it was everything was so uncertain, mm. unprecedented crisis, and what was your feelings in you know assuming that position? Mm. During oh, the period. I, you talk about COVID, uh, at the start of it, I was in MSF. Yeah. Mm. I, I still am, but yeah. at that time I was heading the ministry and we were concerned about impact of COVID on uh, people in our welfare homes, you know, elderly people in the institutions, and we were concerned. So health minister concerned about nursing homes, I was concerned about the welfare homes. Mm. We were concerned about people, people losing jobs, needing financial assistance. And then I, I took over MND yeah. and uh, had to grapple with uh, the stresses and strains that the construction sector faced. There was mm. a lot of angst, there was a lot of uh, fear. Uh, uh, I mean, you just try to remember what it was like, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lockdown, uh, yeah. circuit breaker, effectively a lockdown, circuit breaker. We've never ever had construction sites shut down all across the island mm. for so many months. Mm. Yeah. You know, and people were just, you know, workers were in the dorms, contractors did, had to stop work. Uh, other countries cut off their supply of uh, exports because all work had to stop. So supply chain disruptions, uh, it's a nice sounding word, huh? big yeah. word, but actually what it meant was nothing was being produced in other countries to come into Singapore. Mm -hmm. Countries closed their borders, we couldn't get the workers come home, couldn't come back to work. Uh, workers who went home couldn't come back. Uh, workers who wanted to come to Singapore couldn't come. Mm. So worker shortage. And uh, it was really um, down in the trenches Mm. Uh, with our HDB colleagues working side by side with the contractors, with the architects saying, now, now we, we're in this situation, we've never been here before. Yeah. Everyone's frightened, it's existential. But how do we get on and pick ourselves up? Mm -hmm. You know, after circuit breaker, we resume work. How do we sort out the issue of workers in the dormitories who, you know, had uh, there were infections? How do you get your BTO construction site up again? Mm. You know, we had to zone our sites. There are some areas you, you had to zone. Yeah. And then we had to take temperature. We had to, uh, you know, register every every person who went on site. We had to swap ourselves every two weeks. And I had to be swapped every two weeks mm. uh, because I visited work sites. Uh, so over time, we kind of uh, did our best working side by side with the industry, working side by side with uh, the uh, consultants, mm. uh, with our contractors. And we managed to uh, catch up on BTO delays. So we have uh, caught up with about 80% mm. of delayed flats have been the keys handed over. And we're very grateful for Singaporeans for their patience. Mm. So our commitment next year, mm. the, delayed, the rest of the delayed keys, we will complete them and hand them to the homeowners. That'll be the final of the 100,000 flats. Ah, no. So, mm. so the, uh, uh, these are flats that were affected during COVID. Uh, that okay. means people expecting it to be uh, completed. COVID delayed everything. We've caught up on 80% of it. The remainder next year, we will complete them and hand them over belatedly yeah. after mm -hmm. quite some delays to complete all the delayed flats. The 100,000 flats, uh, uh, you see, supply demand, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you supply demand leading to all these imbalances, resale price going up, B2 application shooting up, uh, property market uh, on the upward march, uh, people getting anxious about housing, uh, the solution is to address supply demand to make sure that you restore the equilibrium. Mm. Don't need to have, you know, fanciful big ideas, just solve supply demand. Mm. And to do that, we had to ramp up demand uh, quite uh, significantly. So you recall 2021, in the midst of COVID, we all were still wearing masks, we had limit mm. restrictions on going out, how many people can go out, how many people can dine. Uh, we committed to say, okay, uh, because of all these concerns, we will ramp up supply by from 2021 to 2025, yeah. we will launch 100,000 new BTO flats. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Then on the private housing side, not often spoken about, uh, last year, for instance, uh, we released an uh, unprecedented amount of land for private housing mm. because private market and HDB market are linked. Yeah. Yeah. They're not separated, they're yeah. linked. Yeah. So you have to make sure that supply demand 
is addressed for both sides. Sure. Singaporeans are buying homes on both sides, right? uh, either HDB or they're buying private. So last year, we released land for private residential homes, the highest in 10 years. Mm. 9,250 uh, home units worth of housing. And this year, first half, uh, government land sales for first half was the highest single launch for government land sales mm. in more than 10 years. Mm. And last year, we completed uh, 43,000 homes, both HDB and uh, private. Yeah. 43,000, the highest since, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, since 2018. Yeah. Mm. Highest number of completions in a year. So see, so when you, you start completing more flats and, and private homes, you hand over keys, yeah. people start leaving the rental market, go into their homes. Mm -hmm. So you start addressing rental. Mm -hmm. All right, you hand over keys, people start getting less anxious. They see completions, they start getting less anxious. You pump up more supply. They say, ah, application rates are coming down. Of course, if it's a hot site, popular hot location, everybody rush for it. Yeah. But as a whole, you start to see now BTO applications coming down. Resale prices starting to stabilize. Mm. And mm. Uh, when it comes to property market, you know, um, you have to apply measures firmly, but carefully mm. because you don't want to crash the market. Sure. A lot yep. of people's uh, lives are at stake. Yeah. Sure. So, so, so yeah. when it comes to those sort of measures and the policy changes, right? You know, um, starting off when you took over in COVID, it was a challenge that no one had seen before, right? Yeah. And you said you you were working in the trenches with the, your colleagues from HDB, but um, how does the the feedback from the eventual homeowners or potential homeowners? How did that factor into it, and how do you go about it? Because yeah. last year, October, the Forward Singapore. A pact was uh, announced but just to understand a bit more about the process of how you work with the, your eventual uh, homeowners hmm. yeah. so there were a couple of things we had to do yeah. as I said uh, the very first uh, priority for me when I took over MND was to uh, tackle the impact of COVID on construction mm. and we literally mm. had uh, meetings uh, often Skype calls Some at the start was every day mm. We were meeting HDB, we were meeting MOM, we were meeting the contractors, the architects, all the different associations, dealing with big issues, dealing with small issues, dealing with minute issues that affected uh, things on the ground. Mm -hmm. But subsequently, when we kind of got that tempo going, we had to start looking at uh, uh, what Forward Singapore was looking at. Essentially, uh, recognising that Singapore continues to change and evolve. Mm -hmm. Singaporeans' attitudes towards uh, housing, attitudes towards family formation, uh, their aspirations and needs for housing also change. Mm. And so uh, my colleague DPM Lawrence decided let's let's do an exercise where we reach out to Singaporeans, reach out to many people, understand uh, how our society has evolved and what needs to change in order to refresh that social compact, mm. that understanding between government and people and between Singaporeans amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. So when it came to housing, uh, we decided let's let's have housing conversations. Mm. About a decade ago, we had housing conversations under Corbyn One yeah. you know, to get a feel of uh, the pulse of society when it came to housing. What were the angsty points or the concerns? What were the hopes and aspirations? So COVID was not so easy to organize, but we had uh, virtual sessions. We had uh, uh, physical sessions where we had, you know, social distancing. And then as kind of the COVID started to uh, recede, we were able to meet more and more people. Mm -hmm. And some, we, we would just make sure that we didn't meet in echo chambers, which means everyone's of the same sure. background. We wanted to have a mix of people, mm -hmm. young people, seniors, singles, married couples, divorcees, single parents, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. a three generation families, uh, academics, researchers, uh, property market people all coming together and having conversations. And uh, my colleagues kind of uh, innovated. You know, they came to me and say, Minister, we're going to try to gamify things mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. some of these issues can be rather dry to present. I said, sure not, you know. I was a bit yeah. sceptical, uh, to be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. And they did a, uh, design their own game to enable uh, different groups of Singaporeans in each of these, what they call, focus groups mm -hmm. to be able to kind of sit in, wear the shoes of HDB Mm. Sure. and to be able to wear the shoes of other groups of Singaporeans. So if a young mm. person, maybe you represent, you, you, you play the role of a senior mm -hmm. and then you tell me what your concerns are and try to understand. And then the senior, you you be a young person. Uh, mm. okay. you know, and, and, and surprisingly, uh, it was very effective. People mm. uh, appreciated gamification because they could understand the trade-offs yeah. in a way that wasn't too preachy, you know, like I'm mm. telling you, I'm telling you. No, no, I, I experienced it myself. Yeah. 
Mm. And from there, we we had you know we had the focus groups, we had dialogue sessions, we had the physical sessions, we had the virtual sessions, we had people send uh, uh, survey forms back to us, and so on and so forth. Mm. And uh, many of these uh, resulted in a lot of the changes that you see today. Mm. I give you one example. Uh, during some of the sessions, uh, I, I met uh, some young young couples. I remember there was a session at uh, Skip. Mm-hmm. And this was young people and middle-aged people. And a couple came up to me. They said, you know, Mr. Lee, don't mind, you know, now it's tea break. I want to talk to you. And, uh, you know, we we are still studying. My, my, my boyfriend is in NS. I'm still studying. Mm. And, you know, we've known each other for a long time. We are ready to settle down. But your flats take, during COVID, it was about four to five years. Mm-hmm. Now it's back to about three and a half. It's come down to pre-COVID levels. But back then, uh, mm. they were saying, I'm worried about how long it'll take. You know, by the, you, you, Mr. Lee, you, you listen to me. I'm still studying. He's in NS. By the time we uh, graduate and he finishes NS, we have to work for a year. That will take us to what age? And then we ballot. We don't get it on the first try. Mm-hmm. Then finally, when we book, I have to pay a deposit, right? Yeah. Uh, then after the deposit, then I have to wait another few more years, three years, four years. Mm. That I could be close to 30, to even mm. past 30. Yeah. And we're ready to settle down. Uh, we are, we are, we're quite settled. Um, but if I apply now, I book now, but I'm, I cannot get the grant because he's in NS, I'm still studying. Mm. I'm not eligible for the grant. And my siblings did the traditional route and they got the grant and they could pay the down, down payment. Mm. So I said, hey, this, this issue, uh, okay, let me look at it. And then somehow at the Meet With People session, young people come too. And mm. I, I found coincidentally, a couple more people facing the same issue. Let me say, okay, let's dive into it. Let's talk to our own colleagues. Let's talk to, let's, some of my colleagues went into the universities, went into mm. the police, ITs, had dialogue sessions too. And we found that actually there's a, there's a group of uh, young Singaporeans who are prepared to settle down and say, well, let's apply when we're studying, maybe final year, mm. you know, one year before graduation or somewhere where they're studying. Mm. And then by the time they finish school, they start work shortly after they get the keys. Mm. But they have difficulty paying the down payment. Mm. So I asked my colleagues, what are we doing to help this group of young people? All right? So they said, well, we have the uh, Deferred Income Assessment Scheme. Now, these are all the names of schemes to help young people. Yeah. You can defer the assessment of your grant and loan till later when you collect your keys. I said, hey, that's a good move. Mm-hmm. But they said, the minister doesn't solve the first down payment. Yeah. Mm. The, to solve that, we have the Staggered Down Payment Scheme, another scheme, mm-hmm. where if you're studying or you're in NS or you just started uh, work, right? Uh, we can uh, we allow you to uh, pay only half the down payment. Other people pay ten percent if they take HDB uh, loan. You pay five. Mm. If you take bank loan, you pay twenty percent. But for young people, you pay ten percent, mm. so half. Mm. But for some people, still, if their families are not uh, you know well to do from modest background, yeah. family can't help. Yeah. Siblings can't help. So we said, okay, with this, why not be make a further change and we work on the new scheme which we just announced a couple of weeks ago. Mm. We enhanced the down payment, staggering on the down payment to 2.5%. Mm. And immediately we got response from those who had actually shared with us. They said, hey, you listen to us. Yeah. And I said, this can be done. We had to study it carefully. It took a while, but we implemented it. Mm. The other thing that we did uh, pursuant to uh, uh, the conversations we had during uh, Forward Singapore was uh, this new category called first-timer parents and married couples. Not sure you heard about it. Mm, yeah, Last yeah. February, we launched it. Yeah. And it was from some of these conversations. And it was unanimous, you know, almost. In all these groups, whether they're seniors, whether they're parents, whether they're elderly, whether they're, you know, married, divorced, single, you know, fiancés, mm, mm. they would say, actually, you know, uh, you should be giving priority to those who are buying their very first property, very first home. Mm, mm. And during COVID, there was all this stress about apply so many times cannot get. Yeah. Because applications shot up, right? Yeah. Shot up during COVID. Before COVID already, there were some of these rumblings, but COVID itself made it worse. And mm-hmm. people are saying, I'm trying to get married. I've just gotten married. I've got young kids. I cannot get my very first home. Yeah. But others are. Mm. So we looked at it and said, okay, there's a first timer scheme, but people are telling us that they are prepared to give way to those buying their very first home. Mm. Never bought a home before, never bought resale, never bought private never bought property anywhere. So we decided, okay, from this group, let's give extra support to those who ROM already, mm. right? Or have children and are younger set, so below mm. 40 years old. Mm. And there was a lot of support for that. And we launched it 
last year, so early days yet. So mm. October, December last year, we had the taste of this scheme come into come into play. Yeah, and uh, so early data shows that of these two groups, those who are in this category, that means they've already ROM, gotten married, have young. Some of them have young kids. Some of them don't have kids yet, but just ROM. Nine out of every ten of them got a Q number within hundred percent of the flat supply. Mm. That means very, very high chance that they have a chance to select and book. Mm. Mm. So it's starting to show results. We have to see when they start a- applying and booking. Mm. Another piece of feedback we got was uh, some angst. People are saying, "Actually, I hear that uh, you know uh, other people are applying. They treat it a bit like a lottery. Mm. They were aren't quite serious about booking. Yeah. But because of what they do, I cannot get my number. Yeah. They said, I, I heard from my friend. My friend told me that they." They got a number, they, they didn't book. Yeah, mm. you know, so I, they feel like, but I didn't get a number, and I'm about to get married. And this person, uh, that other person, got a number but didn't book. As a result, I think I'm affected. So we said, hey, let's go, let's go dig and check. Mm. Is that so? Because you know, you cannot give queue number to everyone who applies. Yeah. Otherwise, you're giving false hope to those with very large queue numbers. Let's say you have hundred flats. Right, we give more than uh, zero to more. You give more than one to number one hundred. We give extra, mm. just in case some people choose not to book. Yeah, and it turns out that for uh, roughly around forty percent, who are given a chance to book, that means they have a number. Mm-hmm. HGB calls them down. Hey, come, come, choose what you want. Mm. You want to book, right? You balloted, right? I give you a number. Come and book. Forty percent on average say I don't want. Mm. Mm. Which means that a lot of people who may want it cannot get a number. Yeah, cannot even get a chance because got no number. Mm. So when we looked at that, we said, "Hey, you know, what if we do something to reduce this group?" And there was a lot of support. There was applause in the different groups, yeah. saying, "Hey, why not you tackle this problem?" You know, seemingly small issue, but if we can solve it, I think it was help a lot of couples who are waiting to buy a flat. Mm. So we then scra- scratch our heads. What can we do? Some people say, "Why not you increase from ten uh, dollars, make it a thousand dollar." Mm. To book, mm. and some people say, "No lah, that's crazy." You know, one thousand dollars. You mean the fee is a thousand dollars? How can people afford? Mm. Then some other people said, "No, why not uh, put put a ten thousand dollar deposit? If you don't select, you can get the money back, but at least you have to have skin in the game at the start. Mm. You can go towards your down payment." Yeah. Mm. So others said, "No, not everyone can afford that amount of money, especially mm. if they just start to work or studying." So we decided, and after listen, listening to people, we decided to uh, introduce a scheme last year. It's called non-selection count. Mm. If you book or if you're given a number and you don't select, unless you've got really good reason, yeah, all right, or unless there are very few units left, low floor and all that, it'll count against you and we'll mm. treat you as not serious. You go to the bank of the queue for a year, mm. all right. And if you're second timer and you still do this, you cannot apply for a year. Mm. Mm. Then, so we don't have the data yet, but it seems as if anecdotally that people are a lot more careful. Uh, about booking mm. or applying, applying mm. because they know that ah, you know, it can it can it can affect me, and I hope that in the next few months, if we can get more data, I hope to see that this forty percent who get a queue number but don't book comes down. Mm. That means more people who legitimately need a home can get. So all yeah. these are tweaks mm. and adjustments which might not seem very uh, important to in the big bigger scheme of things, but actually for. Ordinary people, it really solves problems. Mm. So, so just mm. yeah, on talking about like the larger scheme of things, right? Mm. Like I, I've heard you say in talking interviews about the philosophical concept of home, mm. why home is important, and you've also alluded to, um, you know, what what the forefathers have set up in terms of, you know, the HDB program and, and making sure that every Singaporean owns a home. What has been your philosophical take on on mm. this this idea of? Uh, every Singaporean own a piece yeah. of of Singapore. Yeah. I think uh, there's a kind of a national perspective, and then there's an individual perspective. Mm. Mm. The two broadly align, because actually, if you ask, uh, you do a big survey of Singaporeans, we remain a nation of homeowners. Mm. Mm. We remain a nation of homeowners, uh, so it aligns. But when you look at the individual, what does home mean to you and me? I think for most of us, home is safe harbor. Mm. It's a place where whatever the stresses and strains in the day at work, you know, whatever issues you have outside, when you go home, it's safe harbor. It's a place where you can, you know, let your hair down. You can kick off your shoes. You don't have to be formal. Uh, it's, it's your own home. Yeah. And if you're family, you're providing for your family. 
Mm. You have a place to you know spend quality time with family. Or if you're on your own, your own, you have quality time to yourself. You can you can do your own things. You see. Mm. Uh, so so that is first and foremost the importance of a home. And and if you are a renter, let's mm. say you 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 believe that home is a place that you rent during COVID. Many people were stressed up because yeah. if they had been renting all this while, they found that they were suddenly at the landlord's mercy. Yeah, mm-hmm. things went up and down. And if yeah. you can't pay rent, off you go, right? Whereas it's home, uh, quite a lot of Singaporeans still owe mortgages and installments. But even if the employment market was choppy, there were there was a lot of forbearance. There was a lot of support. Mm. Uh, tenants were not so lucky. Mm. And of course, older Singaporeans, some of them will say, you ask them, uh, mm. like, do you still have to pay on your home? Then they mm. say, oh, mm. the house already fully paid for. Don't mm. need to worry. Yeah. You see, so it's now fully paid for. It's their home. No need to worry about installments anymore. So so first and foremost, home is safe harbour. Home is where you uh, uh, you have you raise your family, you look after yourself. And also when you have a home, you want to know that your home is a store of value. Mm. Mm. So if you need to move, your home is also an asset. Mm. Now, the idea that of home as a safe harbor and as an asset is being mutually exclusive is not, not the case. Mm. I don't think many Singaporeans see a home as purely an investment, nor do Singaporeans see home as purely just a place to live in. Mm. All right? and, and therefore, it can just be an expense, just pay to, pay to live. Many Singaporeans like the idea, and I think many people around the world like the idea that their home is theirs, yeah. they own it, they're free to do things with it, subject to limitations. Uh, and that eventually it's a store of some value. The amount that they're paying hundreds of dollars every month, thousands of dollars every month, mm. whether cash or CPF, is not just expensed away. Yeah. Mm. It yeah. is building up some value. And that eventually when they need to move, then they turn their home into an asset, monetize it, and then have some resources to buy their next home. Mm. Maybe nearer to town, maybe somewhere else that's bigger, Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and then they can do their renovation, have some for older people retirement adequacy. You know, they mm-hmm. can what they call right size, yeah. mm-hmm. five room sell, buy two room, have some money in the piggy bank for retirement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but how do you balance? You know, I, I I understand like the definition of home. That's what I feel as well. You know, mm-hmm. um, that it's a safe harbor. But how do you then balance or keep in check the fact that if it's there's that asset building as well, mm-hmm. uh, but for example, for me, right, I, I got my resale three years ago and when me and my wife think about, okay, the next step, you know, as much as our asset has appreciated, whatever we are looking to purchase in future also appreciates. Yes. So then how do you balance it just turning into like a cascading waterfall of everything appreciates, hmm. which in some way means nothing appreciates. Yeah. yeah. No, so that's the thing about ensuring that the housing market doesn't run away from economic fundamentals. It's a mantra mm. we always repeat. Mm. Mm. And that's really short form for saying that housing prices mustn't run away from the reality of the economy and of people's income levels. Mm. Mm. And if income levels don't grow as much, but property prices shoot up, often because of speculation or investor interest and so on, or fear of missing out, then something's wrong because it runs away from affordability. Mm. And a bubble may form and it could cause a lot of problems if it bursts. Mm. But if income levels rise across the board because economy is doing better, people you know, with their skills earn better incomes, we get good jobs, with good education and skills, people are earning better incomes, then I think it is natural to expect that property prices will generally keep in step mm-hmm. or go up. Mm-hmm. But the key is to make sure it follows, you see. Mm-hmm. And we... In Singapore, our property market is not a free-for-all. It's not left to the private sector. And so you can imagine why in much larger countries, uh, that much larger than Singapore, mm. they have the housing crisis, housing shortages. Mm. And you mm. look at them, there's so much land. But if you leave it entirely to the private sector, then you will have all these supply-demand imbalances. You have the incentives to, uh, uh, to, to sell at high prices. You know? But for Singapore, probably the only country in the world with a majority of people living in public housing. Mm. As uh, DPM Lawrence said, it's national housing program. In other countries, when you say public housing, when I go overseas and talk about public housing, they say, oh, you mean for the low income, you mean rental. Mm. I said, no, no, no. You know, 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing and it's like, what? Yeah. You know, and 90% own their own homes. 
and of the low income, 80% own their own homes, low income. So they ask, how is that possible? I said, because we have to take control uh, and ensure that even as the residential market, there's the elements of the, the free economy, mm. the free market, but you must intervene appropriately. And so for us, we do so through supply demand. Mm. And supply means we inject both public housing supply, private housing supply. Demand includes cooling measures, mm -hmm. includes a uh, loan to value. You know, they are also macro prudential in nature that protect people when, you know, interest rates are up, economy is not so clear. We put in some of these measures, not just to cool the market and cool demand, but also to protect people from exposure. Mm. Um, so, for example, ABSD moves. In mm. 2023, we increased the ABSD for uh, Singaporeans and PRs yeah. who are buying their second and third property onwards. Mm. Mm. And for foreigners, we, from very first property, we increased to 60% ABSD. Yeah. Mm. And it's a very clear signal to forestall uh, investor interest. Mm. Because when if supply demand imbalance, if demand includes investor demand, yeah. local and foreign, mm. then you can imagine it will exacerbate the problem and bring affordability further away from ordinary Singaporeans. Yeah. So we had to make that move. Uh, not an easy move to make because people were like, why, why do you do this? Yeah. You know, what kind of signal are you sending? But for us, it's very clear. The Singaporeans who want to buy both on the HDB market as well as the private market. Mm. And that move was intended to be clearly tilting in favour of those who are buying for owner occupation. You're buying for yourself to live in, mm. largely. Yeah. All right. So we did that move in order to tilt in favour of owner occupation. Mm -hmm. So that's how we, we intervene. Yeah. Uh, but your point about asset prices going up, it must go along with healthy, across the board, income growth. Mm -hmm. You see? Otherwise, your prices ought to remain at certain levels. Mm. Right, mm. but for Singaporeans who buy, most of them buy from HDB. Yeah, yeah. Right, they buy from HDB and they get a, they get generous grants. Mm. Mm. Firstly, when you buy the sticker price, already is discounted off the market. Mm. So if let's say uh, June we have a BTO launch, please look at our brochures. Mm. We'll tell you what the range of prices are for say three room, four room, five room. Mm. There's a range because some are on the second floor, some are on the thirtieth floor. So there's a range of prices. Some are facing uh, better. Uh, view, uh, some are facing not so good view. So that variation of prices. Mm. Then the next column, we put down what the comparable resale prices are like. Mm. And those, mm. you can see there's a, there's a clear gap. Yeah. And that mm. gap really is part of the discount and subsidy we give to first-time buyers of HGB flats. Mm. And on top of that, you have means-tested grants. Yeah. They're based on the income levels of Singaporeans. So already, uh, Singaporeans who buy from HGB have an initial leg up already. Mm. That's one. And those who buy on the resale market, if they qualify for grants, then already there's a, you know, a HGB supporting these families uh, by their resale flat. Now, let's, let's accept that resale prices are high now mm -hmm. because of COVID uh, supply demand imbalance. Uh, with all the measures in place, we're starting to see stability. Mm. And we hope that things will stabilize and then uh, have a soft landing. Mm -hmm. That must be it now. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, just... Uh, touching on what you said earlier about, uh, you know, uh, what the priorities are. You know, Singapore as a city and, and our, you know, the Forward SG, the vision for Singapore to be a global hub for, I mean, we just hosted Taylor Swift for like a bigger series of concerts and all. How, is there a tension in your decision-making process in terms of like, uh, you know, con controlling investor interest or at least influencing investor interest in the market versus like this vision of, people coming into Singapore and all wanting mm. to move to Singapore. How, how do you square that off when you think about your policies or talk to people in other ministries about mm. this? Eh? That, that, no, Singapore is both a global city mm. and uh, a home. Mm. Mm. Global city means that, you know, because we rely on the world for a living, yeah. right? We rely on the world to make a living. Uh, we need to be open. We need to be able to travel to work. We need people to come here to work. We need to welcome people to set up business here, invest yeah. here so that Singaporeans have got new opportunities and jobs. We need to uh, keep our economy going strong so that you know, we get the resources to do all the things we need to do, mm -hmm. especially on the social side of the house, especially to invest in Singaporeans. And so we have concerts, we attract them in, we, we attract companies to come in for more cutting edge uh, enterprise so that we keep ahead of the competition mm. all around us. Mm. But at the same time, when you do that, 
Uh, you see what happens in in other so-called global cities around the world in much larger countries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whether in China, you have Beijing, Shanghai, you know. In 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 the UK, you have London. In Australia, you have big cities like Sydney and so on. Mm. And uh, uh, those become magnets because they are global cosmopolitan cities, and they're magnets for people from around the world, including businesses, and they're magnets for their own people going mm. into those cities. Mm. And uh, there you see a lot of these cities uh, with uh, housing affordability challenges that are far more acute than we have. Mm. All right, in some cities, it can take say twenty years of your family income to buy your own home. In Singapore, it's around five, four, three to five, five plus years for HDB. Mm. I give you a statistic. Uh, we look at the last year's data. Mm. We want to have a look back. The data is irrefutable. Twenty twenty three, we looked at all Singaporeans. Who are buying their first HDB flat? Mm. Okay, those who are buying BTO, including those who buy resale, mm. and we found that more than eight out of every ten Singaporeans who are buying their first flat, either resale market or uh, from HDB, more than eight in ten uh, were able to pay for their homes entirely out of CPF, mm. no cash outlay at all. Those are the kinds of indicators we want to look for. So about roughly a quarter of their monthly household income goes towards housing, and virtually all of it paid by CPF. All the cash that they take back from their work, they they use for their own purposes. Mm. So those are the kinds of affordability indicators that we watch. There are many indicators. Uh, these are not projections. These are actual data that we look at, uh, and we see how in other countries, if you don't manage housing well, mm. you can be a very cosmopolitan global city, but not a home. For your own people, mm. and in those cities, the the locals, even young people, get pushed out of the city because they can't afford to to pay for mortgage. They can't afford to rent yeah. in the city. They get pushed to the suburbs or they get pushed to inner cities. Mm. And so we we don't want that to happen in Singapore because we are a city state, mm-hmm. and uh, we are the only city state in the world that is sovereign and that is an island. Mm. So for us, if We just leave housing to the private sector entirely. I leave it to the the private market. Uh, we will have far worse housing problems than some of the big cities in big countries mm. are facing. But, but do you think that? Because um, you know, you mentioned that uh, Singapore is one of the highest rates of home ownership in the world, right? Uh, which is which is very unique, lah. Um, but do you think it's also setting up? Uh, how you say very. Un, almost unrealistic expectations for people to think that okay, every tier of housing is supposed to be affordable, uh, because I mean that goes back to like because you know well, one thing the the more we research about the for this podcast and looking at the policies that have been done there have been a lot of changes mm. a lot of updates yeah. uh, I mean even when I got my resale I got grants okay uh, and there is this notion you know even with the prime plus standard housing okay one of the messages is that we want to make sure that city ho- housing in the inner um, um, center city is accessible for people of all incomes yeah is that almost something that is So unrealistic that it almost becomes a double-edged sword, mm. because mm. then then it you expect this, mm. but maybe the reality is not everything is affordable. Mm. Uh, do you feel that that sometimes adds to the disconnect, mm. or is that something that you all grapple with as well? Yeah, I, I think when we talk about affordable housing, uh, you know, there's a whole range. Yeah, and ultimately affordability, you can have some. Uh, matrices. You can have some indicators to so have a sense of affordability, and you can build to provide housing options for different uh, groups of Singaporeans at different mm. income levels mm. uh, and different needs, even. But ultimately, affordability is also an issue of personal realities, and some of it is driven by need. Some of it is driven by choice. So some people might choose to stretch themselves. Mm. Right, they may find that well. I think I have the potential to earn more. I will, I will push the limits a little bit more, subject to how much I can loan. Mm-hmm. All right. So some people will will do that, and they find that wow, then it's not affordable. But it is a choice they made. Um. So so that it, there's a, an objective element of affordability, but there's also a subjective element of personal choice or even personal circumstances. Mm. So so it's not just because we have the data, then people will say I accept that it's affordable. People mm-hmm. have their views, and you have your own views. Mm-hmm. People would have told you about their perceptions of housing affordability, sometimes from first-hand experience, and we we respect that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But the thing is this, you see, um, when we talk about this uh, prime plus and standard, mm. our starting premise is, is this. You know, we, we, we are a society where, you know, because of education, because of uh, job opportunities, we have many Singaporeans who've done well. And that's why we talk about issues of inequality, mm. because there's mm. possibility of social stratification. Mm. And uh, if we look at other older societies, other cities, what has this led to? It has led to not just social stratification, it has led to physical stratification. Mm. And, and, and in cities, you see some areas that become so unaffordable to the ordinary person mm. that it, be, it become a, a whole district of only wealthy people mm. or people from outside or from overseas who can afford to live there. And then the people who, who are the original owners or people who live in the city find that they have to go further and further away. Mm. And in Singapore, you're starting to see that, right? Mm. There's some parts where yeah, luxury condo belt, yeah. all right? Or certain areas near very good schools, or well, popular schools, I may say. Yeah. Popular yeah. schools. And then you see the property prices going up because then better off people try to buy so that they're nearer to the school. Now, all these are, are natural instincts for many people, perfectly normal decisions that they make. But at the macro level, it causes society to change. Mm. And it also changes where people live. And, and so we, we, we thought, we don't want to go there. Mm. As far as we can, we don't want to go there. And how do we do that? And so when we decided to do uh, prime housing or prime location housing, we said, look, this is the conundrum we're in. Uh, there are actually flats in the city centre, you know that? Those mm -hmm. old flats, mm -hmm. yeah, the yeah. beach road, you have Brass some, Passa the Brass yeah. Passa. Yeah. Uh, but, if we, but they were built at a certain era mm. where Singapore was, you know, much less developed, less mm. prosperous and less stratified. But today, if I were to knock it down and I were to rebuild it, I will be stuck. Mm. Because if I build there, then if I apply the same amount of market subsidies across the board, those flats will be quite expensive. Yeah. Even though they're cheaper than the resale options or cheaper than private for sure, yeah. they will still be out of reach. Mm -hmm. But then I'm fair because the subsidy I give to someone buying woodlands is roughly the same subsidy as someone in town. Mm. But if I want to enable more Singaporeans to afford the flat in town, then I must give more subsidy. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes a lottery. I know that I'm getting a very good deal here and I know that when I do resell on the open market, I get a windfall. Mm. And someone who says, I get a flat in Woodlands or somewhere else and someone getting a flat in the town centre, that guy is really getting a windfall. It's not fair. Mm. So that comes to the issue of fairness. Right? So the first issue is affordability and accessibility. All right? Do you have an inclusive neighbourhood? Good location, but you have a diverse group of Singaporeans, not just well-to-do. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, if you want to achieve affordability, that means the prices are more affordable, you must give more subsidy. You want to have inclusive you know, neighbourhood where it's not just wealthy people, you must uh, give more grants mm -hmm. and subsidies. And then when you do that, then it becomes unfair. So mm -hmm. we decided to do prime plus and standard precisely in order to achieve all three as best as we can. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that when the plus and prime flats are rolled out, plus will be rolled out in October this year, mm -hmm. Uh, they will be uh, cheaper than if they were launched under the ordinary scheme, for mm -hmm. sure, because we're giving more subsidies. But in return for that, we then have to put tighter constraints for a number of reasons. One, to be fair to other people. Mm -hmm. I give you more grants and subsidies so it's more affordable to you. In a way, you're lucky to get that flat. Mm -hmm. But you have a longer minimum occupation period. 10 years you must live there. You cannot, number two, you cannot rent out the flat ever. Mm, mm, mm. You cannot rent out, you cannot treat it like I stay somewhere else, I rent out this property. Mm. You can't. All right. And thirdly, when you resell it, yeah. I want to make sure that it's not just affordable at first instance and then on resale it escalates, right? Mm, mm, mm. I have to contain who can buy on resale in order to prevent it from running away mm. on the resale market. So we have, uh, uh, for the first time, tight restraints on who can buy on the resale market. Mm. Uh, so, so all these are efforts to achieve social objectives, actually. Mm. And uh, you're right, it's not easy because we are a small island city-state. Yeah. 
But if we don't do anything and we just let the status quo be, what you'll find are uh, uh, windfalls if you build in the city center and then ultimately you run away from affordable mm -hmm. levels, right? Because you make it affordable, you give people a windfall, other people get unhappy. But then on the resale market, they sell for lots and lots of, uh, I mean, they sell it very high. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes unaffordable other than for the first owner. Mm -hmm. And then our society will change. Then we might decide don't build there. Mm -hmm then you find that in those good locations in the city center around MRT and all that only private housing mm. because mm. you're afraid of the windfall problem. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So I, I think we have to weigh carefully and decide what kind of a society you want to be, mm. what kind of living environment do you want to have in Singapore? Highly stratified one that you see in more mature cities, mm. in much larger countries, or do you want to say that, yeah, Singapore is small, we don't have the land, uh, but we want to achieve certain social outcomes for our society because this is what we believe in. Mm. And then we try our best. The schemes are very novel. The, the policy is very novel, but we have to watch it very carefully and be prepared to, to make adjustments along the way to mm. achieve our uh, social goals and to ensure that housing remains affordable for people. Mm. Mm. So, so, I mean, you do, do you see that as a real possibility? Because like what you mentioned, studying uh, how it is in other uh, you know, other countries and everything. It's it's a very common we problem, whether in Europe or the US. You know, US would be inner cities and mm. in Europe, they go to the outskirts of the city and all. Do you think it's possible that Singapore creates a unique way that could even be an example for others to follow? Like, is there something in the, the that we can buck that trend? Mm. I think we have to try. Mm. We have to try. And this year, we marked 60 years of home ownership program. Mm. Home ownership for the people scheme 60 years ago. Uh, and just interestingly, uh, just uh, when we were celebrating the 60th uh, anniversary in, in a, in a low-key way, yeah. some of my older colleagues showed us old photos, black and white, and they said, mm. this was how BTO applications were like. <laughs> and there's a black and white photo, mm. and they had a chalkboard and a bowl. And they're saying, in the past, uh, flat selection was faster. I said, how did you do it so quickly last time? Today, people complain it takes a few months to select yeah. their flat. They said, Mr. Lee, today you get the queue number, you come down, you can choose what you want and then we can work things out for, for each family. But back then, two bowls. One, I pull out number so-and-so, your family has got selected for a flat. Mm. Other hand, other bowl, this is your flat. No choice. Mm. It's like bingo. <laughs> That's like how that, we do it. Do you want to yeah. go back to that? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I was just asking. I was just asking. Uh, it's a bit like bingo. Yeah, it's like bingo. Yeah. Uh, I see, yeah. I see. Yeah. So, so, and you know, you mentioned that when you look at other society, other cities, and other similar um, uh, circumstances around the world, like how, what is that process like? Like how, how does you, you and your team go about studying how it is in other countries, learning from there, and then realizing, okay, we need to do something different. Hmm. Well, firstly, uh, there are um, different indices on housing affordability. Mm. And you look at that, they of course apply the methodology, but you can compare ourselves against other countries and other cities. Mm. And uh, we also visit mm. other places. Uh, there's a lot of material about the housing situation in other countries. Um, there are social commentaries about housing and, uh, so and social equality or inequality. And then we look at our own situation and recognize that actually uh, in the early days, we set off on a very different path. And it's because we have this foundation uh, known as the HDB, which builds for the majority of Singaporeans that we have certain levers and options to allow us to try to attempt to avoid some of the things that we see elsewhere. Mm -hmm. When you say, can we be a model for other countries? I don't, we, we don't pretend to be able to teach other people. We're too small. Sure. But there are people who come to Singapore and say, I want to see what you are doing. Mm -hmm. Or can you come to my country and share with us what you do? And often people say, I, I, I would like to do that. I would like to try, but they have tight constraints. Mm -hmm. Some of it's political, some of it's got to do with their psyche as to what governments should or should not be doing. Mm -hmm. Some people say in, in our country, the idea of government building homes is just you know, unthinkable. Mm -hmm. Or the idea of subsidizing homes, or the idea that public housing is just taboo. You know, when you talk yeah. about public housing, it's really uh, it's, got a, it's a dirty word in the mm. country. Mm. So, so everyone has their own situation. I think we, we look out for our own people, mm. uh, but we study how some of these 
the, what I call invisible hand of uh, social and economic forces, yeah. how they shape cities and shape societies. Mm. Mm. So, so, I mean, just thinking about like that, the idea that, you know, the Singapore government has a much bigger hand in uh, providing public housing for people here. I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, you go online or you talk to people, they will ask, like, to do them, like, it's the very obvious thing is, like, if if there's so much, if the Singapore government is so influential in the whole thing, why can't they just put a cap on, on the prices of, of resale or put a cap on on the prices that such that don't let them fluctuate so mm. much? Uh, mm. Or, you know, institute something where you can only sell back to HDB or something. Mm. Mm. What what is your what do you say to, to people? Because I mean, just hearing what you're explaining about it, it's such a complex mm. interplay of so many different stakeholders and all that. Mm. So I'm just wondering like when someone comes to you with saying that, like what what would you say to them? Yeah. Um this idea of uh, uh selling HDB flats to people and then if they need to move, they return the flat and then mm. come back to HDB again, uh was suggested during Forward Singapore. Mm -hmm. There are people who said, you know, why not, you know, everything just return to HDB. And long ago, it was like that. Long ago, long ago. But when we kind of laid out the full consequence of that model, then people said, the one, the one. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Uh, if let's say you buy your, some of you have gone for BTO flat, some of your friends would have gone for it, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 you wait for a launch, you like the location, you see how many flats there are, you say, okay, I think... I work out the math, I can go for it, put in an application. Uh, then whether they get or don't get is purely ballot. It's luck, right? And they get frustrated because high application rates or some people don't select. So they say, ah, I cannot get. Mm. So buying a flat from HDB, we have a system, but it's not without its critics, right? Because it's a, there's a bureaucracy around it. There's a system, there's time taken, uh, there's a process. And if you tell people, you want to buy your next home, you have to return back to me and then you go through the ballot again for another place that you want, mm. whether it's near your parents or what, then it. Many of them will say, some will say, yes, I like that. But many people say, no, I, I, I would. I, thank you for the first process. I got my flat. Mm. Now let me make my own choices. Mm. And the idea that I bought my own flat, yes, I got a ballot from HDB. Um, I've lived in it for, the, for a certain period of time. Now I want to move nearer to my parents nearer to my children's school, nearer to my workplace. Oh, I want a bigger place. I want this block, this floor. And they want to have the choice to be able to say, I get my agent, or I go myself and I look and I find this unit, I view it and I make a decision. There's greater autonomy. Now, first flat, okay. I, I go through the HDB system. People prefer that kind of thing. Mm. You see, and the uh, idea, you bought your first flat, you get a grant, uh, there's a housing element to it. Eventually, when you want to upgrade or you want to move, whether it's private or it's another HDB flat, uh, you you sell and some you you make a, a small profit from there, and then you can use it to buy a bigger place. Mm. And you work within your own budget. Mm. I don't know when people talk to you about it. Do they want the kind of autonomy? Do they share with you, or they they're happy to return everything to us? Um, I think it's a. Uh... The, that's why I was asking the question because mm. it does seem to me there's a much more, there's a lot of different factors to think yeah. about. Uh, and yeah. I think you just talked about something that, yeah, you know, the idea of people over time as they grow older also, the the things that they want also differ. Yeah. That they want to be, you know, in the open market or thinking about upgrading to even other uh, bigger properties and all that. Mm. And then having to go through the whole process again is a deterrent. Uh. Yeah. But I mean, for you, have you have you heard that as well? Uh, I mean, haven't heard. I, I think where it stems from is just looking for alternatives. Mm. Because mm. I think generally the sentiment that, that um, I mean, I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a homeowner as well. We see online is that w how is this sustainable? Mm. Um, so, so, I mean, going back to the whole concept of home ownership, mm. uh, I know you mentioned that it is one of the fundamentals that was laid out like way back and it's something that you are trying to and you and your team see as critical mm. but you know when you said that the trends of or perspectives towards housing are evolving yes when i think about trends across everywhere right you know like now if you tell someone you stay in a job for like 30 years mm. it's it's not as common mm. whereas my parents generation people saw jobs as like a 30-year commitment yes is there like why is it still so critical that home ownership is so important mm is there a possibility that maybe as a country, you know, 
the world is changing so fast. Maybe we should be more open to becoming a renting society. Hmm. And how you grapple with that? Because everything we've been told since young is that Singapore is a tiny island. Yeah, Everything is scarce. Hmm. So just to a lay person like me, okay, population is increasing. Our land, we can reclaim all we want, but it's, nev- it's almost never going to match. Hmm. How is this sustainable? So hmm. is it a time for a perspective shift? Hmm. Or for, for you and like generally the philosophy is that home ownership is a mainstay and we need to keep focusing on it. Yeah. But for us, it's um, it's both what we see as uh, an anchor for society, but also a reflection of what Singaporeans are telling us, mm. which is that having a society where people own their own homes, look after their own place, right? It, there's a different kind of feel mm. when you have a place that is lived in by people who own their own homes mm. versus a place where tenants come and go all the time. Um, it's not to say that Singapore is entirely a homeowning society. You're right, there are people who, who, who rent. There are people who rent out of necessity. Mm-hmm. For example, they're in between homes, they're in between uh, their, their housing choices. Some of them out of circumstances, some of them out of choice. They say, I, 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 I'm not ready to, to, to buy a home, I want to rent for a period of time. And there are options in the market. All right? There are private um, options, there are HDB options and HDB we subsidize for the very low income. We subsidize for people who are stuck in between and need interim housing. And we subsidize for couples who are waiting for their flat. Mm. And so we tell people, your tax dollars help these three groups of people. But for everyone else who wants to rent, they, they rent a room, they find their own options, whether it's a condo, whether it's an HDB, whether it's landed. Uh, there, there are people who rent and therefore we have to maintain a rental market in Singapore. Mm-hmm. That's why we watch carefully uh, rental prices. And I said earlier, in, uh, just now, that we are starting to see rental prices start to stabilise. But when there was a supply-demand imbalance, people who rented out of necessity, out of choice, felt really squeezed mm-hmm. because they are at the mercy of the landlord. Uh, and for that group of people, they kind of felt, hey, uh, maybe home ownership isn't too bad after all. So, so I think we respect people's choices, mm. but what Singaporeans are telling us very clearly in many of our engagements, both physical as well as by survey, that they still see themselves as wanting to buy their own home. Mm. Mm. Uh, there are some who tell us they want to rent out of choice. Others say, please have options because necessity sometimes demands it. Mm. And so we make sure that there's a healthy rental market. But when we come in with tax dollars to subsidize, it must be for certain groups of people for a social reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and so, you know, like everything you have said, um, it, it makes sense, you know, listening, it's understandable mm-hmm. and can tell that, okay, there is a lot of work that has been put into policies. So what in your view is the reason for, it, the, 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 it still feels like what is being offered, there's a lot of pushback against it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when we look at online forums, when mm-hmm. we talk to our own friends, even when I analyze my own personal sentiments, mm-hmm. it feels like, not enough is being done. Mm. Uh, but everything you said, it, it, it sounds like it stems from actual feedback. Mm. So why do you think there's still that disconnect? Well, uh, some of it's got to do with the situation we're in. I mentioned earlier mm. that there's still a supply-demand imbalance. Prices are high because mm. of that. Demand for BTO still high, but has come down. Mm. So things are improving, but we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, but even when we stabilise, the reality is that housing is a very big ticket item. It's a very big ticket item. No matter how much subsidy you put in, people will always say that housing is, it costs, it's expensive. Mm. You have to really work out your math. You have to take a loan sometimes or get, you know, get enough savings. So it's always a big ticket item and people always uh, take great care when they they buy a home. I'm sure all of us have that experience Mm. when deciding what to buy in terms of housing. Uh, But we are a city with um, which is both global and local. Mm. And uh, uh, we have to make sure that we use our scarce resources, both land and fiscal resources, in a way that tries to meet you know, the broad base of needs. Uh, so that involves, you know, uh, expenditure on public housing. Mm. HDB's deficit, for instance, uh, in 2022-23 was about $5.4 billion. It's social spending on housing. Mm. Um, We have to make new policies like Prime Plus and Standard 
to ensure that in central locations, we can price lower than if we did under the existing schemes. We have to increase the grants. We increased the grants last year. All right, we increase the grants and continuously review our grants to ensure that those who buy on the resale market also get support. Mm. You have to put in measures to not just to increase supply, but also to moderate demand. For instance, by acting against investors and saying mm. that whether it's private housing or public housing, especially private housing, you know, keep the investors away, focus on home buyers. Mm. So these are all work in progress. We continue to have to stabilize the current situation. But even at steady state, I think we still have to keep working at it. Mm. But does it ever like wear you down or wear your team down? Because it's one of those, I mean, just from, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't sound like the most glamorous thing, you know, housing policy. It, it feels like regardless of what you do, I mean, you're not going to be bringing in Taylor Swift, you know, uh, <laughs> right? But housing policy, because like what you said, it is such a big ticket item. <laughs> Yeah, does it does it wear you down? I think it's always a challenge. Um, mm. And when you come to crisis and things are, you know, really, uh, 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 it puts everyone under a strain for sure. Mm. And I'll say the COVID period really wore a lot of people down, all of us. But we knew the mission at hand and we just went ahead and pushed ahead. But this period is uh, an attempt to stabilize the market at a time when the economic outlook isn't all too great now. Mm. You know, interest rates higher for longer, economic outlook affected by what's going on around the world. Uh, Singaporeans concerned about uh, the economy, concerned about jobs. Um, and so we start to see a lot of prudence there. Mm. Um, so it does take a lot of effort to ensure that we stabilize it, but don't uh, cause anything precipitous. Mm. Yeah. Right? Uh, so you have to take care. And uh, we want to work in parallel to all this work dealing with the crisis, stabilizing post-crisis, stabilizing the property market, we in parallel are also undertaking a lot of moves uh, as part of Forward Singapore to realize uh, housing and home ownership uh, and the future of public housing uh, in a way that Singaporeans of the future would like to see. And those mm -hmm. conversations have started for over a year and we are still work in progress. So you see housing as uh, the changes we're making, prioritizing uh, young couples, uh, providing for seniors through age well. Age well is uh, about ensuring that as we grow old, we, we, we can live comfortably in our own homes, in our own yeah. estates. So a lot of work on that front as well. We didn't have the time to talk about that. But uh, housing, very clearly, again, the social housing, right? So HDB is not just about infrastructure. It's, it's housing plus something else. Mm. So for young people, it's, setting up their first home mm, mm. Uh, for people in crisis or people who are, you know, uh, struggling with issues, rental housing that comes with social support. So we have Comlink Plus. Not sure if you heard about that. Comlink Plus. We call it Comlink Rental Flats. Mm. So rental housing that doesn't just give shelter to people who are very low income and who are struggling with their personal situation, but it comes with social support that's integrated. Right? Uh, Housing and aging. We have our two-room flexi short lease flats for people who want to monetize from their old home, keep something for retirement and live in a smaller unit. And we've gone even further, community care apartments. Mm -hmm. Community care apartments are not just flats. They come with uh, community living rooms. They come with uh, social programming. They come with some housekeeping. It comes with some uh, healthcare and some physio. So it's mm -hmm. a housing with a package that supports you as you grow old. Mm. Uh, housing and, uh, uh, and, and climate change. All right, uh, the, our buildings in Singapore contribute 20% of our carbon emissions. So mm. we also have to play our part uh, in our housing, both public and private housing, to uh, achieve our net zero goals. Mm. So allowing us to monitor how much uh, energy we use, how much carbon we put out, mm. uh, greening our buildings more, putting solar panels, harvesting rainwater, uh, reducing energy usage in the common areas and in our homes. All these are our efforts. So it's always housing that achieves some other purpose. Mm. Right? So all these are, are, are part and parcel of us transforming our housing landscape to achieve uh, broader goals. Mm. So uh, just, just when you talk to young people, the younger generations of Singaporeans, uh, what do you think is the... Um, because we, we've talked about a lot about the complexities of 
mm. the property market, uh, you know, being trying to be a global city and everything. What do you think is, I wouldn't say a misconception, but what, what is the perspective that, that maybe is harder for the person on the street to understand mm. about, you know, the interplay of housing prices and and Singapore and our grand vision as a city and all. What what do you think is the that misconception that people might have about hmm. about your your role in planning everything as part of HDB hmm. and all? I think people are concerned about affordability and accessibility, as I said mm-hmm. at the start. But some people also have views about uh, what the balance between home ownership and asset should be. Hmm. And there's some people who say, well, leave it to me. Don't put too many constraints. I mm. put my own money down. I worked hard. Uh, I should be able to deal with my property as I, 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 I deem fit. Mm. Uh, and so they push back against some of the more socially oriented restraints that we are putting. And then they, on the other hand, there are people who are saying that housing should really just be for own occupation for you to live in. Mm. You should not even think about uh, 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 earning any profit when you sell. In fact, some say, just, as, as you said earlier, yeah. everything just give back to government. Government will decide mm. uh, through ballot where I can live, mm. in which area I can live. Yeah. Uh, not everyone is prepared to, to give up their autonomy. So there's a whole diverse uh, set of perspectives on housing. Uh, but but what have you, what, from, from your perspective, what have you heard? What are you, what are you, what are you hearing from your contemporaries about? Mm. Uh, I mean, the, I think the, for me, the, what you hear the cost of living is it weighs a lot on people's minds, uh, and you know, being a parent to a young child myself, yeah. right? You know, these uh, I mean, issues of like uh, affordability, but also you know, the size of of uh, living space and all that that people uh, they only realize after you have a kid, lah. That's mm-hmm. one thing you don't realize. Oh, having a small child, you need a lot of space just to accommodate the kid, lah. You know, running yeah. around and things like that. Yeah. So. There, there are all these perceptions that oh you know why why can't this be fixed or controlled and, and everything, uh but also you know hearing you and and also just reading ourselves just how complex the whole thing is and having to understand uh, supply chain issues and all that that create all these uh, gaps in supply and demand so so that's where I've. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's very hard to bring out a dinner party, right? You know, oh, let me tell you about the supply chain issues and then construction issues. But dessert come also cannot. Yeah, be exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just very long conversation. What you hear is, oh, I just you know there are delays in my getting my flat and all that. Yeah. But it's 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 some, not easy to really articulate all the issues around it, Yeah. Have you seen it? Have you heard? I mean, for me, heard? it's almost like there are conflicting ideals. Yes. Like one mm-hmm. is get a big home, own your home, you know, mm. but another one is like, have more kids. And then mm. another one is like, you know, upskill yourself. Mm. And it feels like, how can I do all that? Because I mean, mm. I got married a year and a half ago and we are in the stage of thinking about family planning. Family planning. Mm. But when we look, we're like, oh, okay, in our current house, maybe we can get something more. But then, okay, that looks a few years down the road, maybe we don't have kids. But then we know that as a country, we need to have kids. But then, oh <laughs> Thank my, you very much. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm not saying like we're only having kids because of the national duty. Like, Patriot. Yeah, but, but it almost feels like, um, okay, if you want us to have more kids, then like what Terrence said, you know, why not re- make sure the prices of housing is not too high? Mm. So so that's something that I personally feel, yeah. I've, I've heard. And I think that also causes a lot of tensions. Like it almost feels like there's so much resting on us I mean, we we also hear in the messaging, right? We need to have more kids because the country needs it. Mm-hmm. Again, that shouldn't be the only reason you have yes. kids. Yeah. But then also there is this constant pressure to own a house. Mm. And and I guess one downside to having such high ownership is that then the comparison comes into play, mm. uh, which affects people psychologically. Also, all your peers own their house mm. and you think, oh, maybe I'll rent. But then, then and that kind of plays in also. Cause, so I, I, I'm, it, it's interesting you say that part of the policy making involves the social impact. But how is that generally balanced? Because whatever you do in housing, hmm. given it is such a big ticket item, it is such a pillar of people's lives, it will inevitably affect other parts of life. Yes. So like, do all the ministries kind of like have to fight it out? Like who 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 wins the message? Yeah. No, I think Terence, your first point about uh, uh, the complexities of it all, I think mm. it's not fair to expect Singaporeans to understand all of this. Mm. It's in conversations like these that we try to unpack uh, some of the considerations, unpack mm. some of the issues that are at play. Uh, and in, you know, when it affects them, for example, delays in getting keys, we, we explain in order to seek the understanding mm. and assure them that we are working hard and delivering keys, for instance. Yeah. Then when it comes to rising resale prices and why we've had to do the things we did, injecting more supply, why we had to develop certain areas to 
build more homes, why we have to uh, increase grants, why we have a big deficit that grows during this period. We need to explain because people will ask. Mm. It doesn't immediately affect them, but they want to know why these things are happening. And it's our responsibility to try to explain in a way that people can understand and in a way that allows people to make decisions mm. because it's a big ticket item and you're going to live in your home for quite a number of years. Mm. Mm. Right? And, and to your question about uh, you know um, uh, the stresses and strains on Singaporeans as they are as we feel a need to do a lot of things all at once, mm. settle your own housing, but also decide on family planning, also on jobs and upskilling. Uh, that, that is, that is um, that's contemporary life mm. uh, in Singapore and around the world where we have to multitask and deal with a lot of things all at one go. And that is why for housing, we, we through HDB, try to ensure that we can offer a range of housing options for people of different budgets mm. in different locations. But you, in, in as much as we have this very important uh, mechanism called HDB to do all these, we cannot do it in an unsustainable way. Mm. Because ultimately the resources to do all these come from Singaporeans. They come from the companies who you know, yield the taxes to us, mm. right? And so on. They come from uh, the resources that we generate to do all these things. And, and, and so we have to do it uh, judiciously we have to do it sustainably and ensure that uh, we uh, provide housing provide grants so that people see they say ah, okay this is what I can afford this is what I will go for then as they you know progress in life they get a higher paying job they get promoted or they change industry or they have children or they settle down then they will want to have more choices mm. And if in the scenario you mentioned earlier, everything is decided by HDB, by government, then it really constrains people. I think the stresses will be even more. Mm. Mm. I, my circumstances have changed. I really need to move there. But if it's subject to ballot again, I might not get it. Mm. So it constrains choices and I, I think it adds uh, a different layer of, of stress. Um, but when you provide a whole range of options of housing in the public and private market, you can buy from HDB, you can buy from the resale market, you can buy from private developers, uh, you can rent, uh, you can have co-living options, mm, mm. right? You can stay together with family, you can stay on your own. Uh, then, of course, people then have to decide based on their budget, based on their need, and based on their aspirations. Mm. So when it comes to having children, I mean, housing uh, that certainly plays a part, but all around the world, you see that uh, there are other forces at play when it comes to fertility. Mm -hmm. In East Asia, for instance, you know, fertility is very low. And, and part of it has got to do with uh, 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 gender roles and responsibilities. Mm. The role of a father, the role of a mother, uh, and with more educated uh, uh, population where women uh, uh, are extremely highly educated, in, in some instances more than men, mm. uh, that, uh, you know, they, they would like to see uh, men also playing an equal parenting role. So my colleague uh, DPM Lawrence Wong talked about the importance of us making that change in our society as well, mm -hmm. that fathers also play an, an equally uh, involved role in raising children. And, and hopefully that will cause uh, families to then say, then, then let's have more children. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is a complex issue. It's yeah. not entirely just about one particular dimension yeah. that decides whether society will have more children or less. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited to see how the plus prime standard, uh, you know, the, the classification plays out. And, and I mean, even announcing recently like Gilman as an area is to be, mm. you know, looked at for residential housing because I've lived in like, you know, uh, big cities like New York and, and mm. travel extensively, uh, you know, Europe and stuff like that. And those, these problems of, you know, stratification within society seem almost insurmountable because of the infrastructure planning that was a hundred years, from hundred years ago. Mm. So, it's quite exciting to see that okay, Singapore we're trying something different, and we don't know we don't know like if it's going to be a model for everyone to follow, but it's going to it's got to work for us yeah. And that's where I'm, I'm like, um, you know, generally as even just uh, just looking at it from even a slightly more geeky academic point of view, it's it's an interesting experiment. Right? Mm. But yeah. but do you think you know like like what you said is complicated, and you know you said from the academic point of view, yeah. do, like does it ever is it ever a challenge? 
where you're almost making it too complicated. For mm. example, right, mm. I've always used Apple phones and then I tried Android and then I hated Android because there were too many options. Mm. So I sold my soul to Apple already because mm. it simplifies things. Is it is it a, a debate ever internally that, okay, we can go like all these different options, but it might become so complicated that people are turned off by it. Hmm. Because even when I got the process of my resale and reading through the grants, I had to sit down and be like, okay, let me understand this. And then when we were, I was trying to understand the Prime Plus model, it's it's a lot to take a in. A lot to like. take in, yeah. Yeah. Is it ever a debate internally? Okay, if we can do this that might cater to multiple groups, it will work, but it will be so complicated. Yeah. Let's simplify it. Hmm. Of course, there's no policy that will make everyone happy. Yeah. How do you balance that? Yeah. There's always a risk that if you want to uh, cater to many people's different needs, mm. your system mm. will get more and more complex. Mm. Uh, and it's a constant struggle because you know that you want to uh, address this requirement, that need, mm. that group, yeah. the situation. Uh, but ultimately, you think we have a complex system, but I think we have one which tries to be as simple and clean as possible. Mm. You have BTO, right? And you have uh, now Prime Plus Standard, and we, we describe it on the basis of uh, location. Mm. All right? Clearly, the mature, non mature classification looks very simple, mm -hmm. but it's completely outdated. Mm. Yeah. Because you, you, know, you think about uh, Jurong East as non mature, people scratch their head. Right? Yeah. Yeah. How Kang is non mature, it yeah. still is. Yeah. Yeah. But those were classifications of a bygone era. Yeah. Now, when we describe Prime Plus Standard, people understand because Prime means right in the city center and immediately surrounding it. Plus means these are areas where, you know, uh, near MRT station, mm -hmm. near your city center, your, your town centers. And people will know that because oh, demand very high. Mm. You know, resale price show very high one, you know, mm. and they're more expensive. So we try to make it intuitive. So Prime Plus and Standard is everywhere, everywhere else. Mm. And then we break down the boundaries that are artificial and which actually cause more confusion mm -hmm. between mature, non-mature. So we try to simplify by making it more intuitive to the current live experience. Mm -hmm. Then when it comes to, you know, the, the uh, BTO application process, we uh, have different priority schemes. And these are in order to meet the needs of different groups of Singaporeans. Mm. So those who are getting married, you know, first time we give them more chance, mm. more priority. Those who are already ROM married, have children, we give them first dips almost. Mm. Yeah. So again, you're right. There's certain complexity in trying to meet different groups of people's needs, but we try to have some clarity in the different categories. Mm -hmm. Then when it comes to the, the resale market, what are the grants available? And the grants are means tested. Mm -hmm. So look at your household income and then we determine how much grant you get. So those who earn less get more, those who earn more get less mm -hmm. grant. So there is a way to look at it more simply. Of course, when you go into the weeds, then it gets more mm. complicated. Yeah. But unfortunately, you make it too simple, then you end up having to deal with lots and lots of appeals. Mm. Mm. Uh, and over time, as our colleagues encounter more and more situations, they say, okay, better take care of this group, that group. Mm. It does add to the complexity of the system, mm. but, there, but it works for some of these groups because then you don't have to come and appeal. Yeah. Mm. You see, already we have many appeals, mm. but as we see more trends, we say, okay, we better take care of this group. Mm. Um, so you're right. Uh, we always have to juggle between a system that's very complex and try to meet all sorts of situations versus one that is clean and easy for people to understand, uh, but at risk of, you know, uh, not catering to the reality of complex living mm -hmm. and the circumstances people are in. Mm -hmm. And on your point about, uh, you know, our city, I mean, I mentioned earlier that we are city-state. Yeah. You know, if you look at other cities, you go to say Seoul, you know, the airport is quite far away, mm. right? Uh, you don't, I don't think there are military air bases in the city. Mm. Uh, of, or the, for that matter, other cities. Mm. You know, the, the idea is that in a city, a city has certain needs, but there are things that you can push far away. Yeah. You, the city needs it, but we don't like it in the city. You put it far, far away. But Singapore is unique because there's just 730 plus square kilometers. Mm. And everything our city needs must be inside the city. Mm. Our uh, incineration plants, our power plants, our waste disposal, our crematoria, yeah. our you know, everything that we need for a fully functioning sovereign state 
and fully functioning city has to be inside the city. Mm-hmm. And in the whole world today, there's only one in the Singapore. Mm-hmm. Fully sovereign city-state and some more island. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. our pressure on planning for every need, not just housing, but planning for aging, planning for new, uh, new kinds of industry so that we keep ahead. Yeah. planning for education you know, because education more peaks of success right so you need to have different mm. kinds of institutions planning for all sorts of things planning for greenery you, want, you don't want a city to be a concrete jungle you want uh, our island to be green and have biodiversity in it we want a city which is uh, not shorn of our soul mm. where you knock down every old building mm. you just constantly renew really Singaporeans are saying I come back after a few years things look very different yeah. things are fast changing there needs to be some you know, emotional and social and social ballast. Mm, mm. So we are also looking very carefully to make sure that we don't lose all our old buildings. We have more than 7,000 over conserved buildings mm. and more to come. Mm. So like Golden Mile, for instance, yeah. we conserved it. We had a, a new suite of measures to ensure that we strike a balance between the rights of owners versus the interests of society to keep that mm. building because of its importance architecturally and historically. Mm. Uh, to a, a newly independent Singapore. Gilden, Gilman Barracks has got uh, old military barracks yeah, yeah. that hark back to our colonial past. And there's architectural merit, but there's also historical relevance. So in the designing and developing Gilman Barracks, we are going to do two important studies. One is environmental, mm. because they're forests and they're plants and animals and streams and all. And then there are also heritage studies to be undertaken because mm. they're old buildings and we need to design uh, how to plan for the new amidst the old and amidst the greenery. Mm-hmm. So that is our approach, you know, in a city where the, the, the tensions of different users are very high. Mm-hmm. And just mm-hmm. housing alone, you know, um, we, we do expect, even as our, our birth rates are low, demand for housing will grow, not just because of need, but because of aspiration. Mm-hmm. Aspiration. Our housing si- family sizes are getting smaller, but the expectation for more space has grown. Mm. within the home and in the estate. They mm. want, Singaporeans want to see more amenities, different kinds of playgrounds, different kinds of services, different kinds of facilities in their estate. Yeah. So we do need to uh, plan ahead of that. And I think we're probably one of the few places in the world where every 10 years, we plan for 50 years ahead. Mm. Mm. 50 years sometimes hit and miss, but you, you roughly know where you're headed. And every five years, we plan for 10 to 15 years ahead. So as we speak, we are heading towards uh, Master Plan 2025. Mm. So Mm. encourage you, encourage uh, your your listeners, go to URA, go to our website, look at the draft Master Plan for, just start off with the area that you live in. Where Mm. you're living, look at your surroundings, look at where, what the plans are and give give views. Mm. Mm. So so, so speaking about the future and and, um, what, what keeps you up at night as you think about the future? What worries you? What anxieties do you have? Um, I think it's uh, making sure that we um, hold a torch, don't drop the ball. Mm. All right, when crisis strike, there are a lot of risks. Make sure that you you soldier on and do well in the crisis, and then make sure that you carry the torch uh, and uh, uh, carry on the DNA of past generations that has seen us well into today, which is the idea of stewardship. Mm. Right, that the, in this generation, yes, we are responsible for making decisions, but we can be consumers. That means we say, okay, what resources we have, let's consume. Let's mm. consume the land, let's consume the greenery, let's consume uh, the resources. Uh, or we can say, let's be responsible consumers, also known as stewards. Mm. Consume mm. what we need, but the mindset is whatever we use for ourselves, whatever we do to the present, uh, is with an eye to ensuring that there's continuity of this little place, this little rock called Singapore, yeah. that it will continue to flourish and do well. And that the next generation, including those that are not yet born, when they come in, into this world in Singapore, that their parents and they uh, have a good fighting chance into the future mm-hmm. because of the vulnerabilities that Singapore, that, 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 that Singapore has always been in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have more resources today. We have a, a lot to, to celebrate. We have achieved a lot as a people. Uh, but remember that it's the hard work of the past. Mm. We continue to work hard, but we must make sure that as we consume today's resources, mm. we keep uh, something for the next generation and we hand to them uh, a place that's better. 
mm. because of our efforts today. Mm. So when it comes to land, do we consume everything and just use all the land that we need for today's housing needs? Or do we keep some parcels for the next generation? Mm. So I'll give you an example, Long Island. Mm. Mm. You heard of Long Island? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Long Island. We, we know that on our podcast before. Also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't do anything, you know that more than a third of Singapore will be underwater. Mm. Mm. So the latest forecast, 1.15 meters sea level rise by the end of this century. If it's spring tide, heavy rain, four to five meters sea level rise. Yeah. Mm. And more than one third of Singapore, or about a third is below four to five meters above mm. mean sea level. Mm. Long and short of it is, if we just kick the can down the road, we don't plan far ahead, leave it to our children to solve their own problems, uh, Singapore will be uh, inundated by the sea. Mm. Mm. So we have to plan. And some people say, wow, so much resources today, but I will not live to see the benefits, but it's really for the next generation. Mm. So we are planning an island that uh, will protect parts of Singapore, uh, create fresh water options, but also uh, create land for the next generation to dream what they want to use it for. Mm -hmm. Is it for housing? Is it for greenery? Is it for research? Is it for jobs? Yeah. They, they, they give a, a canvas to them. Mm. Mm. I mean, the the yeah, we we did talk about it, and it was quite a. I think it's interesting because the you know just the idea of that we're going to create this this uh, area that is you know like uh, we have gone there as East Coast Park and experiences mm. as as such, but our kids, our grandkids, all it's going to be something different for them, like It's mm. going to be like a little lagoon and and everything. Um, but I think we were saying that, hey, you know, when we were trying to Google like Long Island and everything, uh, New York yeah, came Long, out, like, Long, Long Island, New York, and then Coney Island, New York. Oh, and Long Island tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're like, oh, okay, maybe we need to like come up with a very Singaporean name or identity for it. What would you suggest? Well, that's a, well, if I had a chance to name the <laughs> island now, <laughs> Yalabad Island. <laughs> but yeah, how, how did Long Island come about? Yeah, the, the, yeah. We're not very creative. La. <laughs> because you look at it, it looks long. Yeah. So it's a long island. But I'm guessing it's a, it's a working title. La, right? Working title. In Probably you have to name the district in future. Mm -hmm. But the idea is a long island, not a long wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, initial, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were, there were two possibilities, right? Yeah. One yeah. is the long island, more complicated, yeah. more expensive, take longer to do. The other one is just built from uh, I think roughly around Fort Road or earlier, all the way to Tanamira, just one long wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Long wall, I don't know how many meters high, and every few kilometers, one pumping station, yeah, one pumping yeah. station. Mm -hmm. So that one be easiest to do, direct cost less but mm. I think what will happen to East Coast Park is it's not going to exist anymore mm. it's going to be a wall yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah. so how long will the study take the study will take five years five, five years we've just started study yeah. will take five years uh, then we can have a better feel of feasibility uh, how long you'll take but easily this project will take a number of decades mm. 20, 30, 40, 50 years you know we have to see what the studies tell us because mm. it's a big it's a big multi-generational uh, piece of work yeah, 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 um, yeah. yeah. Well, but uh, cool. I think I think we covered uh, a lot. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing your thoughts and taking mm. the time to to chat. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it will continue to be a hot topic, mm. uh, HDB mm. and housing, and maybe at some point we can have you back again to answer more questions. Lah. Maybe after Prime Plus and Standard. Yeah, we'll, we'll, see, how yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see how people respond to it. I was going to say when Long Island is there, <laughs> la, but there are we talking long time, like 30 years more. Yeah, 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 after, after, yeah, after, <laughs> after Prime Plus <laughs> and Prime, yeah. Uh, yeah, Standard. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so the only thing left on our podcast is every every time we have a guest, or so every podcast we do have the segment One Shook Thing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we, 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 we can still give you a bit of time to think of something as we go first yeah uh, and it's just something to share with our audience like yeah. um uh, terence you got a one sure. short thing i actually just uh, recently watched the pikachu movie uh the live action pikachu movie i think on uh, hbo or something mm -hmm. uh and i think it came out during the pandemic so you know couldn't see it in cinemas and all uh but i start ryan reynolds as the the pokemon character pikachu and I think I was quite surprised because I was going in expecting some children's movie. Uh. Mm. And uh, actually, you know, Ryan Reynolds, his style as Deadpool and everything is very snarky, uh, very non-PG kind of humor. Mm. So he actually brought that to the character of Pikachu. Mm. And uh, it was very refreshing because usually you think like, oh, if it's a Nintendo game character, it'd be very, very PG and all. But it wasn't that. It was quite, he, 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 he brought in a, a Ryan Reynolds kind of performance. Mm. so I thought it was quite interesting watch for people who 
you know, just want an easy uh, watch, but uh, nothing too, nothing too uh, intense. But still, yeah, not bad. Yeah. So you you were surprised by the quality of the movie? Yeah, yeah, I was surprised uh, by the quality. And Ryan Reynolds was funny. Like, he's a funny. It's guy. like there was the other Ryan Reynolds movie where he's the background character. Uh, in a computer game free, or something. Free, free guy. Free guy. Free guy. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah. Have you seen those movies? No. Pokemon or Free Guy? Yeah. Pokemon. Uh, or, or Deadpool. Like, Deadpool, Deadpool version of Pokemon. No, no. Yeah, oh, actually, <laughs> I would describe it as like Deadpool. the Deadpool character as, as Pikachu. As la, Pikachu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pikachu. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't watched it yet. And it's on which, which platform? HBO, I believe. HBO, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, my one show thing is... Uh, you, you know the Daily Show uh, in the US, mm. the one that Trevor Noah used to host? Trevor uh, Noah, yeah. yeah. he has left. Comedy. Uh, yeah, he has left. And now the legend of uh, news through comedy, Jon Stewart, has gone back to be the host. Mm. And I, I've been watching his clips and it made me remember why he is really the legend. La, because the way he delivers his lines mm. is very informative, it's very incisive, it's very funny, and he's really the master. Mm. So it's like throwback to the to the good old days when he was host. La. And just in time for the election, US la. election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think he, he probably felt like a, a, he, there was a calling for him to come back. Yeah. Mm, uh, and he's really the master. Mm. Uh, yeah, so those are our one shock things. One shock yeah. thing, yeah. things that you like to do. Yeah, for yeah. me, I I I mean, um, I I do watch Netflix, mm. I do watch mm. Disney Plus. But if uh, you ask me, what's one shock thing I've done recently that I think other people can can you know consider, is uh, late last year I went canoeing. Oh, okay. uh, from uh, the uh, from um, from the uh, sports hub area, mm. okay, yeah, all yeah. the way into uh, Marina Bay. Oh, wow. mm. now literally uh, under the Helix Bridge. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Right, right into the bay, and you see Shenton Way from the water. Mm. Oh, wow. And a couple of years ago, we we did that. Uh, and uh, after COVID, uh, some people reached out to me, and we, we kind of uh, went out with them and many other Singaporeans. And it was at night. Mm. Oh, wow. And it's, uh, it's breathtaking to see Singapore uh, from the water uh, at night. You, mm. you, you canoe past uh, Sports Hub. Uh, past uh, Marina Barrage, past the uh, Gardens by the Bay, mm. then under the Helix Bridge, past the Marina Bay Sands. Mm. Yeah. And, and if you're there at the right time, around nine-ish, you see the show on. Yeah. Mm. And you can go right up to the Malayan, oh, right around see, the bay. And, and, and you see Singapore from a very different perspective. Mm. Okay. It's something that you can... Was it guided do. or like... Uh, it's, uh, guided. It's, it's guided. It's guided. So it's guided. There are lots of guides. And some of the, the guides are kind of... Uh, uh, to say tour guides, I don't think does justice to them. They're actually uh, like uh, history buffs. Uh, tell you uh, and they ask you quizzes along the way. Uh, when when is the first reclamation for Singapore? When did we yeah. build the Marina Barrage? What's the story of uh, how we did all these things? Mm. And it's very informative for, for Singaporeans to kind of uh, enjoy a, a workout. Yeah. Mm. Uh, enjoy the company of people that are paddling with you. Mm. Um, and uh, also be able to just see Singapore from a totally different perspective. Mm. And then you have the, the, the water story, you have the story of uh, insecurity, turning vulnerability into opportunity. Uh, and then you have nature encircling around you. Yeah. You have uh, some of the, uh, 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 you have the uh, 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 white-bellied sea eagles and mm. the Brahmi mm. kites circling above mm. you. And so it's a very, very cathartic, it's, uh, it's a stress relief. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, we organize this from time to time. Mm, um, the uh, uh, Passion Wave, oh, uh, uh, yeah. a group of passionate people under PA who organize these kinds of trips. Every couple of months they do. Okay. Uh, so, so. Does, it, does it, the, the where the Merlion uh, spot is <laughs> water, yeah. doesn't it like go crazy? Don't go too near. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, imagine yeah. you I'm, capsize the Merlion, I think now under renovation. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, if they did it last week, they could have heard Taylor Swift also. La. That's true. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cat 1,000. Yeah, cat 1,000. From the water. From the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but uh, but yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, thanks yeah. so much for that recommendation. Thanks for the time. Give thanks for time. joining us. My uh, pleasure. And who everyone like uh, listening? Thank you for listening. And and where where is one website that they could point point you could point them to to find out more info hmm. about what's happening? A passion wave website. Uh, oh no, I meant just about like HGB. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What HGB? Yeah. Uh, like the you were saying the yes. the, the master plan. Master right? plan. Okay, yeah. so there's yeah. a URA website. Uh-huh. The URA website. There's a there's a, 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 a link that takes you to uh, the draft master plan. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, and of course, the long-term plan for Singapore for the next 50 years. It's, mm-hmm. it's all there. Mm-hmm. If you want to find out more about our housing uh, policies and approaches and issues, the MND and HGB websites would be a good place mm-hmm. to start. Mm-hmm. And we'll con- continue to upload more information so Singaporeans understand what we're trying to do. Okay. Mm. okay. And Passion mm. Wave. And Passion, passion Wave. wave. Yeah, <laughs> okay. for the That's what I want yeah. to show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But thanks so much for listening, everybody. Thanks.